Hello everyone, it's me, Bryson P. Welcome to another video. Today we're going to be discussing minimum wage. This is a reaction to Second Thought Channel. And we're going to be discussing the minimum wage debate. And they are talking about how with minimum wage being in the news again, they figured it would be a good time to address some of those things that I never brought up. So we're going to be looking at uh, why some people are against it being raised. More importantly, we examine what the whole debate really shows. Another thing I noticed about the Second Thought channel, in case you didn't know or have read their full description, it does also say down at the bottom of it that Second Thought is a channel devoted to education and analysis of current events from a leftist perspective. So this is a, a channel that is a leftist channel. You know, I'm not giving out my political... Um, side because I don't necessarily have one you know since um me being a convicted felon and you know for a while not having rights to vote anyways because in America if you don't you know if you're a convicted felon you don't have rights to vote um you know you can get them back and I have learned that I am eligible to have my voting rights restored and reinstated to where I can vote in the next set of elections but up until about a year and a half ago, I was, no, not allowed to vote. I was stripped away of those rights um, until I had completed a long list of uh, things, you know. But for the majority of times, a lot of times, most people don't get their voting rights back if they're a convicted felon in the United States. So here we go. We're going to go into this, and I'm going to stop talking because I've talked enough at this point. Thank you for watching. Oh, the U.S. enters a cataclysmic debate over the federal minimum wage. Some people think raising the wage would destroy businesses and raise prices for goods and services. Others think it's essential to keep up with inflation and rising housing prices. Both sides firmly believe that their position is the one supported by hard data and evidence. But there are certain realities surrounding this debate that are never addressed. So in this episode, I'm going to address them. Hopefully by the end of this video, you'll be more informed on the minimum wage debate, but more than that, you'll have a new understanding of why it's such a divisive issue in the first place. Let's start with some basic history. Once upon a time, there were no regulations regarding how much bosses had to pay their workers. This was back in the early 1900s, and because of this wild west of a labor market, those who owned the factories could pay their workers as little as they wanted. And if those workers didn't like it, they could quit, and other starving Americans would gladly take their place. This worked out wonderfully for the owner class. They mm -hmm. knew that a desperate working population would have little choice but to accept the tiny wages they offered, because the alternative was abject poverty and starvation. Over the years, labor laws were established to help prevent this predatory behavior, and in 1938, the Fair Labor Standards Act established the country's first minimum wage, a system that had already been implemented in other developed nations. This legislation also banned the use of exploitative child labor, which had been an incredibly lucrative practice for early 20th century business owners. Could you imagine, like, child labor now? Like, honestly, I couldn't imagine... I couldn't imagine my 11-year-old being, you know, forced to work every day. Like, not... Not saying work, but this type of, you know, forced manual labor, like working, sewing shirts or making shoes every single day. I know that, unfortunately, that, that still happens, I believe, in parts of the world. I just couldn't imagine you know, that time period also. But I would love to be able to go back to that time period and experience it if I could. Just temporarily, not, not for my whole life, but just temporarily and see what it was truly like. The owner class was not happy about this, but millions of parents across the country were relieved that they would receive better wages and that their children would no longer be torn to pieces by the massive dangerous machines the business owners forced them to crawl like into that. to fix. Like that, I could, like that right there, you know? I couldn't, I couldn't do that to my kid and just, well, I just force them to do that. Why would you force your kid to do that? But different time period and all that, you know, you can't, I mean, you can't hate them and knock them for it. We learn from our mistakes and we learn and that's why we make laws and things. But at the same time, they were being exploited. They were full on being exploited. 
Almost 30 years later, in 1966, an amendment to the Fair Labor Standards Act raised the federal minimum wage to $1.60 per hour, and extended coverage to federal employees and some farm workers for the first time. This particular amendment is a critical bit of historical evidence, because, as we'll see later, a recent study made some important findings regarding the minimum wage and employment. Now, let's take a look at how the minimum wage has changed over time. Six decades ago, in 1960, the minimum wage was $1 per hour. Over the following 60 years, the wage steadily rose, today sitting at $7.25. Taken by itself, this graph looks pretty good. The line goes up. Here's the problem. Just listing dollar amounts without historical context does not- Watch this, it's about to blow up. Because that's a horrible ascending trend line compared to what the actual value of the dollar, like what the cost of things are and all that is. Not give an accurate depiction of what those amounts mean. <laughs> Let's look at the same line adjusted for inflation. That's a lot less impressive. These peaks and troughs represent each time the minimum wage has been raised and inflation wiping out those gains. Taken as a whole, we can see that compensation for minimum wage workers is actually significantly lower today than it was 60 years ago. This peak here, representing the 1966 amendment to the Fair Labor Standards Act, marked the high point of the U.S. federal minimum wage. $1.60 an hour in 1966, adjusted for inflation, equates to almost $13 an hour today, nearly twice our current minimum wage. Okay, mm -hmm. so we know that real compensation for workers is lower than it was. And even then, if you've watched my other videos, I say I make more than double. I make more than that. Sorry to bounce you all around so much, but yeah, I make more than that. I still complain was in the past. But this is where we get to the crux of the matter. Many people don't care that it's lower because they believe that a minimum wage should not be a living wage, that you should not be able to support yourself on this wage because jobs that pay that little are meant to be beginner jobs or things to keep retirees occupied. Let's talk about that. Do That's students true. and other That's young true. people make up the bulk of minimum wage workers? Yes. Are they typically able to rely on their parents for housing? Yes. Does this mean that they don't need more money in order to simply survive? In many cases, yes. Does that mean we should allow their compensation to slip so far behind the rate of inflation that their pay has next to no value? No. Justifying poverty wages simply because many minimum wage workers are students is not a valid reason to keep paying so little. And the minimum wage is a poverty wage. According to several studies, there's not a single county in the entire nation where a minimum wage earner could afford a one-bedroom apartment. If the minimum wage had simply kept up with inflation like, so then why is that, you know, then why, why is that acceptable, right? If there's no, you can't even live off of it and there's no place in the entire country that you, that you could even possibly live as an individual, then why is that acceptable as, because it's just as acceptable as being homeless and everything else. Just, oh, well, you know, you can go make more go get a different job go find a second job go do this go do that there's other options that's that's your that's your options and that's what you're told and productivity gain since 1968 it would be over 24 dollars per hour today that's a lot of surplus labor value that's been taken from workers and given to their bosses unsurprisingly the owner class is almost uniformly opposed to raising the minimum wage at all but what's more disappointing is seeing people who make $16 per hour fighting with people who make $7.25 an hour when their bosses make thousands of dollars per hour. There's a certain mindset in America where people believe if I just scrimp and save enough, if I work enough overtime, if I do what I'm told, if I just work hard enough, one day I'll be the one making thousands of dollars per hour. Of course, the owner class is thrilled by this. When the working class is divided, those who make twice the minimum wage fighting against lower wage workers earning even a single dollar more, it makes the capitalist's job that much easier. Remember, the people making $16 an hour are still making less than what the minimum wage should be if it had just kept up with inflation and productivity. But let's set this aside for now and address some of the common objections to raising the minimum wage. We'll begin with the objection that raising the minimum wage will increase housing prices. Because a lot of people view that as, it took me the last four and a half years working here to work up to making, you know, thirteen ninety five an hour. But then all of a sudden, Sally Seashells comes over here and gets hired and immediately starts making 15 because that's new, now the new minimum wage. And that's not fair because she should have to work it up, you know, just like I did. And you view it like that instead of 
dang, we should all be making a whole lot more because our boss is making millions of dollars a year and the next couple people down are making millions of dollars a year and the next people a couple down from there are making millions of dollars from a year but then everyone from there is making you know peanuts you don't see that though because you look at this not that i would start by asking those people when was the last time you rented an apartment i imagine it was quite a while ago it's understandable, then, that these people are a little out of touch with the realities of housing prices in the rental market. The federal minimum wage has not been raised since 2009. Between 2010 and 2020, the average apartment rental price has increased by 40%, and by much more than that in some areas. Let me repeat that. The price for housing has increased by 40%, while the minimum wage has increased by 0%. So, to the people saying raising the minimum wage will increase housing prices, that has already been happening without raising the pay to a living wage. The minimum wage has nothing to do with rising prices in housing. And it's, or happen in and it's happening even more now with the cost of lumber and the cost of everything else skyrocketing. You know, the, the cost of wood, uh, building products and all that is outrageous right now. And I believe it was like the cost of a new apartment just in the last six months has gone up by like three hundred dollars a month so like a brand new apartment complex that just now would would open then the average cost to rent one of those apartments would be an extra three hundred dollars more per month than what it normally would be if it was a new apartment complex opening up you know outside of covid because of the cost of the cost increase of building materials be it here we are still getting paid the same. Any other area. When people say your Big Mac will cost $30 if the wage goes up, they're clearly not familiar with McDonald's pay in Denmark. If you work at a McDonald's in Denmark, your starting pay is $22 per hour. You also get six weeks of paid vacation, life insurance, a year of paid maternity leave, and a pension plan. Their Big Mac costs 27 cents more than in America. 27 cents is apparently the difference between respecting your workers and considering them stupid, morally deficient, low-skill workers. The argument that raising the minimum wage will increase prices on housing and goods has no basis in reality. Let's move on to probably the most... But now he does need to put in perspective here that the population of Denmark compared to the population of the United States is drastically different is not even close to the same. Not even close. So, you do need to put that into a perspective that paying, a, you know, taking, taking the entire McDonald's population of the United States and taking the McDonald's population of Denmark, that's completely, completely different. So it would make things different. It would obviously raise prices because it would have to. But it's not going to make it $30. That's just not going to happen. That's unrealistic. Because if it made a Big Mac $30, then you're talking like a steak at a steakhouse would be 150 Most common example. Raising the minimum wage will drive companies out of business. On the surface, this is a valid concern. Many small businesses do operate on razor-thin margins, and an increase in employee compensation could in theory make their business untenable. Let's return to that study I mentioned earlier. In September of 2020, a new report was published that examined the effects of the minimum wage increase as part of the 1966 Fair Labor Standards Act amendment. Their findings? Earnings rose sharply in all affected industries, the racial wealth gap was significantly diminished, and, most importantly for this discussion, there was no adverse effect on employment. Businesses could afford to pay their workers more, they just didn't want to. It's no stretch of the imagination to assume that the same is true today, especially when tax breaks for businesses and the wealthy have increased dramatically since the 80s, coincidentally, the period since which worker compensation has stagnated. So, based on historical precedent, there's no reason to assume that increasing the minimum wage would drive companies out of business, especially when some of the largest employers of minimum wage workers are hugely profitable megacorporations like Walmart yep. and McDonald's. Yep. But let's return to the hypothetical that's so often used on pro-business news outlets. The mom-and-pop family business that simply can't afford to pay their workers anymore. Here's the thing. If you cannot afford to pay your workers a living wage, you should not be in business. This is how the free market is supposed to work, remember? 
Your business is at the mercy of the market. If you don't make enough money to cover your expenses, by free market logic, you should not be in business. Paying I agree with that. Workers I agree with that. I will agree with that. If you can't afford to pay your people a living wage and you can't afford for them to live, then you're not going to have happy employees. You're not going to have happy people there. And you're going to have a high turnover rate and everything like that. Because if you treat your people with respect and you, and you have happy employees and you have a happy work team, then you're going to have you're going to have a successful business because you're going to have people that will stay and will ha have your back and fight for you and work for you. You know, and they they will not complain at the wage that they're paid because they will be happy because they will ha be living a comfortable life. But I guess I don't understand. Maybe I'm just not an American. Huh. That's a joke. I am an American, but at the same time, maybe I just have a bit more common sense or something. Is the most basic expense of all. Again, the minimum wage should be over $24 per hour. If you can't pay your workers a third of that rate, that means the only reason you're in business is because you're exploiting people by paying them poverty wages. This is the entire basis for the existence of the gig economy. We're so accustomed to devaluing workers that companies like Uber no longer even classify their workers as employees, so they can get away with paying them nothing at all. But let's give small business owners the benefit of the doubt here. I'm going to assume that you genuinely want to run an ethical business that pays its workers fairly. I can understand how it would be a challenge to raise your workers pay from whatever you're paying them now to $15 per hour all in one chunk. Wouldn't it make more sense if instead of having to raise the minimum wage by large amounts every decade or so, we chose to raise the wage every year based on inflation and other metrics? This would make the change more gradual and manageable, the workers would be paid fairly, and it wouldn't put undue stress on you, the business owner. Other countries already do this. Instead of leaving the minimum wage in the hands of politicians, in countries like France and Australia, economic commissions reevaluate their minimum wage every year. Yeah, and that makes logical sense because right now, for every, I mean, right now, okay, we've not had a minimum wage price increase since from, what, 2009? And here we are in 2021. You're trying to do a gap up between 12 years. You know, and I, I like the stock market. I understand like charts and graphs a lot better than I did when I was in school. But you can't just, I mean, that's a lot, and especially when we're talking like that in economy wise, you're talking about a 12 year gap up. Yeah, you can't, you can't just pay people from $7, 725 758 to $15, $16 an hour overnight. That's hard. It's hard, and for every year that we wait, you know, you're gonna what have a 15 year gap up and expect to do 15 year gap, and pay. How how can small businesses afford that? You can't because they 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 then have to do what we have to account for 15 year gap on everything else too. I mean, I know that's not a exact correlation of how it works, but you know, it's it's tricky, but. There needs to be some logic here. Raising it to match critical economic signifiers. It's no coincidence that countries that take this common sense approach also have a higher minimum wage relative to the average worker's salary. Unsurprisingly, the US ranks dead last by this metric. Okay, so let's assume you're on board with the idea that workers should at least be paid a living wage. That inevitably leads us to the next objection. If the minimum wage goes up, they might make more money than other low paid workers, like teachers. I'm going to ask you to think about that statement for a moment. If minimum wage workers earn more money, say $15 per hour, still less than what the minimum wage should be, they might make more money than teachers. I would suggest that there's an easy solution here. It's not to demand that the minimum wage stays the same, it's to demand that all low paid workers get a raise. This goes back to the strange American delusion that one day you'll be rich. No. If you're a teacher, a janitor, if you work a trade, if you're in retail, if you sell hours of your life for a wage, you're in the same boat as minimum wage earners. You both deserve to be paid more. In 2020, the federal government spent over $720 billion on the military. And that was just the base budget. When you account for other aspects of the so-called defense budget, you get numbers that are alarmingly close to $1 trillion. $1 trillion in a single year more money than the next 10 nations combined spend on their militaries. There's not a country on earth that could even come close to threatening the US. 
And yet we spend all this money on submarines and aircraft carriers and billions of tons of bombs. We have the money to fully fund our schools, invest in new public projects, and improve the lives of all Americans. Our priorities are just out of alignment with what the country actually needs. Walmart made over $129 billion in profit last year. Supermarket chains saw an increase of over 39% in their profits during the pandemic, while yep. their workers, whom the companies labeled essential, saw little to no increase in pay, despite yep. putting their lives on the line for their employers. Jeff Bezos... You know, like Walmart, they went from being 24 hours, pretty much everywhere was 24 hours, to now Walmart closes at 10, 11 p.m. and opens at 5, 6 a.m. Well, that right there, that time that they're now saving because they're closed, that's a lot of time that they're not paying people, that they're saving on electricity, that they're saving on on so many different things. <clears throat> and then also with self-checkouts, where they're paying less people because you have no uh, checkouts anymore. Even though you, you have 20 checkouts and only five open, now you still have 10 checkouts with five self-checkouts and only two people actually physically checking out. You can't afford to pay those two a better wage to compete with the robots since, you know, there's no other actual people. Elon Musk and a handful of their billionaire friends increased their net worth by a trillion dollars over the same period. These people make more money in a single hour than the average person will earn in a lifetime. And we're squabbling over giving our lowest paid workers an extra $7 an hour? There is a sickness in America that has been programmed into us over the last four decades. We are conditioned to be hyper-competitive, to see earning a living as survival of the fittest, to rely only on ourselves and see others' hardship as evidence of some moral failing. This pull-yourself-up-by-your-bootstraps mentality has seeped into our national consciousness and completely poisoned our outlook on labor. Like most discourse around money, the minimum wage debate boils down to the fact that Americans are so conditioned to be entirely individualistic that they feel personally attacked when someone else's income inches even a cent closer to their own. It's hard to overcome about this mindset. The propaganda of suicidal self-reliance and hyper-individualism makes it incredibly difficult to watch other people succeed. Because deep down, whether we're consciously aware of it or not, watching our fellow workers succeed makes it feel like we have failed. At its core, the minimum wage debate isn't just- That part I agree with. We do have a thing where we don't like to see other people succeed, and we tend to try and knock others down whenever we see them succeed, because it tends to be an insecurity that we have for our own failures and our own shortcomings. I agree with that. But I don't know that that the, the, all the stuff he said prior to that, I don't necessarily agree with that at all. Just about the minimum wage. <laughs> It represents a sort of proxy for all class consciousness in America. There's no easy answer here. The process of deprogramming an entire population will be a massive undertaking. But the first step must be a renewed understanding of class struggle. If you are a worker, whether you're in retail, food service, transportation, whether you're young or old, from New York or Alabama, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, if you sell hours of your life for a wage, you are working class. The owner class, the people who own the massive corporations, the restaurants, the car dealerships, the people who pay your wage and make million dollar donations to corrupt politicians, they have a vested interest in paying you as little as possible, because that will maximize their profits. The struggle is not you versus your fellow workers, but all workers versus the obscenely wealthy owner class who refuse to allow America to become the country they claim it is. A country that works for all Americans, not just those at the very top. All right, so that is Second Thought's view of the minimum wage debate explained. And it's pretty interesting. You know, they do have a lot of good points, and I believe I've already made a lot of those points, and, and hopefully you feel, you know, where I'm coming from. And if you don't, like I said, that's okay. You know, I value everybody's opinion, and this is just mine. You know, I'm some dude that lives in Kentucky and the United States, and... You know, I've grew up with military parents. I, you know, have, have experienced a lot of things and, and just a lot of, of, of different things in life that have yet to be uncovered yet and will be uncovered as we go through this journey together. So I hope that you continue to, to follow me through this journey as I explore 
uh, the depths of YouTube and also explore really the um, the differences between the United States and the rest of the world, the differences between what I've always believed or have been taught or have seen versus what reality actually is or what uh, someone else's reality actually is. So, yeah, great, great, great stuff. And I appreciate you for watching. Again, if you liked it, that's wonderful. That's great. That's fantastic. And if you didn't, that's okay. No hard feelings. It's me, Bryson P. Have a great day. Have a great night, whatever time it is that you watch this. I will see you on another video. Goodbye.